trust you've looked at the title of my message today, which is Intelligently Passionate and WD-40. It'll all become clear, I hope. Because, first of all, I want to ask you, what is it that floats your boat? Now, I don't mean that um, flippantly, because in the world that we live, we are in a kind of sea of opinions, a sea of pressures, a sea of philosophies, and a sea of ideas, and a sea, a raging sea of changing values. And on this sea, what floats your boat? I'm asking you to consider what it is that has, what decisions that it, uh, uh, have been responsible for bringing you to this point today. Why are you here right now? Why do you live the kind of life that you choose to live? Could it be that your boat is floated by emotions, traditions and feelings? Or by reason, logic and evidence? Are both sets of things mutually exclusive or is it sensible to live responding to a mix of these things? I can never forget the first time years ago when I first came to England and they recommended I go across to St Albans Cathedral for Evensong and in there waiting for things to happen there was silence those great vaulted ceilings and the stone columns. And in the distance, the boys' choir was heard coming, those soprano voices carrying through those halls. And I got goosebumps on my goosebumps, listening to it as the voices swelled and they came closer and then entered the choir stalls. And then the organ be beefed up and and supported the worship of the evening. What a beautiful emotional experience it was. And I'm sure you've all recognized that when you go into a, an old church that um, there is this very special aura that makes you feel that you want to meditate and listen to God. But I put it to you that just emotions alone are not sufficient basis or foundation for the living of our lives because it's so easy to be swayed by emotions. It says in Scripture um, in 1 Peter 3.15 But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord Always be prepared to give a reason, an answer, to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But in doing so, do it with gentleness and respect. Let me introduce myself. My name is Lee. I'm an American. Don't worry, I'm not going to attempt the accent. <laughs> yes, my name is Lee. Lee Strobel. I graduated from Harvard Law School with honours, and I was fortunate enough to get the leading job as the legal editor of the Chicago Tribune newspaper some years ago. It's been a wonderful job. My wife, Leslie, and I have, right back from high school, uh, loved each other and, and been on the same page with everything in our lives um, and all the standards that we espoused were common to each of us. You know, my job, though, it does tend to take me into some rough places. Because in order to chase a story, in order to find those witnesses, in order to make those contacts that will help 
to find the truth where even sometimes the legal systems, the courts of our land, have unfairly prosecuted people. It's been a great pleasure and a satisfaction in my job to be a, a researcher using all of my legal skills from Harvard Law School to be able to get to the bottom of contentious matters and seek out truth. And so the thing is, I do tend to find myself at times in rather dodgy places. Maybe, well, I've found myself in a few rather grubby gin joints and, and bars and pubs and, and um, places in back alleys where I've met with people who will help me to chase these stories. And also the competition in this game is pretty ruthless. And so, you see, in my job, I tend to have a couple of drinks through the day and then a couple more at the evening with the boys at the club when I'm finished because, you know, there's a lot of pressure in this job. And so, I've got two problems. One's a small problem and that is, when I come home at night, my little daughter, Alison, who's just two years old, she tends to scarper off to the bedroom. Maybe she just, does, just doesn't like a daddy who comes in shouting and swearing a bit and smelling of alcohol and cigarettes. But she's my daughter. I love her and I wish she would just come and give me that parental hug. But Leslie, my true love, she came to me the other day and she said, Lee, sit down. I need to speak to you. And I thought, what's coming? She said, Lee, you know, over the past months, I've been meeting with a Christian lady and we've opened the Bible together. And yes, I know, Lee, that in, we, we always agreed that Christianity and uh, the story of Jesus Christ was a myth and a lot of nonsense, only for the soft in the head. But do you know what, Lee? With this lady... We have looked at the Bible and I, I am astounded at what I have learned. Lee, this is the place for real hope. The Bible and Jesus Christ is the rock upon which values and lives can be built securely. And do you know what, Lee, I want to tell you? I've decided to give my life to Jesus Christ and be baptized and become a Christian. What am I hearing? What am I hearing, woman? You know, this just wasn't us. I didn't sign up for this when we got married. We saw eye to eye on these matters. You know, it, I, I thought to myself, if she had, uh, if she had, al if she had an alcohol problem, there's always AA or if there's some serious illness, there's always the specialist, all the money we can put towards. But this, to become a Christian, to give her... Oh no, what is the matter with my Leslie? I love her to bits, I want to save my marriage. I know what I'll do. I know what I'll do. I'll use all of my skills as a lawyer to look at 13 different aspects of uh, analyzing a situation and go carefully and methodically through in a legal way. And Leslie will appreciate this, but she is an intelligent woman. So I'll approach this through her intellect. And so it was that Lee Strobel set about to disprove the story of Christ and the validity of the Bible and the resurrection of Jesus Christ primarily. What a nonsense story, but there'd be no, no problem in countering this. So, <coughs> the first thing I did was to ask the witness to come to the stand. 
Let's put Jesus himself in the dock and see whether he himself is persuaded that he is who he said he is. Was Jesus clear about being the Messiah? In Matthew 11, verses 2 to 5, Jesus replied to the messenger of John the Baptist, tell him to consider my miracles. Tell him what you have seen. The blind see, the deaf hear, the lame walk, the poor have good news preached to them. And then in John 8, 58, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was, I am. And Leah is thinking to himself, well, Jesus does seem to think he is the Messiah. This is the same as the burning bush experience, experience when Jesus claimed, I, I am, fear not, because I am the I am, the always existing God. And then in Daniel 7, verses 13 to, 20, 13 to 14, uh, Jesus sometimes took the name of Son of Man. Well, maybe I can undermine things here. Let's look at it. He, and in Daniel 7, 13 to 14, in my night vision, I looked and there before me was one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence and was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All people, nations and men and every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Hmm. Well, Jesus does seem to think that uh, he is not just uh, being pushed into this job. He, he's convinced that he is the Messiah that the Jews were looking for indeed. And then in Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33, Jesus claimed, Jesus claimed to forgive sins, which was only God's domain. And he accepts prayers and worship. And he said, whoever acknowledges me, I will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. That's in Matthew 10, 32. And then in John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not live in darkness, but will, live, will have the light of life. And then our scripture reading, John 8, 28 and 29, Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, now this lifted up, hmm, this corresponds with the method of Roman crucifixion being lifted up on a cross. When you have lifted up the Son of Man, you will know that I am the one I claim to be. I claim to be. And that I do nothing of my own, but speak just what my Father has taught me. He's talking about God. The one who sent me is with me. And so it was that Jesus, um, according to Lee, was able to see that he certainly was unequivocal about whether or not he was the Messiah that the Jewish nation, the world, had been looking for. In Luke 4, chapter 16, um, the people of Nazareth were rather upset. And I always picture this happening because, you see, Jesus had read from Isaiah and um, when he put, rolled up the scroll and when he sat down, and there was a few seconds of silence and Jesus said, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. That's pretty unequivocal, isn't it? Matthew uh, 16, verses 15 to 17. When Peter came to Jesus, he said, who do you say that I am, Simon Peter? And Peter answered, you are Christ, son of the living God, replied, uh, Jesus replied to him, then blessed are you, son of Jonah, or Peter, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by the Father in heaven. So that's a pretty high endorsement. It wasn't a, a man who had point, Peter, uh, pointed Peter in the right direction. It was God himself. Jesus was unequivocal about who he was. <clears throat> and then, in Mark 10, 45, he said, I do not come to be served, but to serve, and to give my life as a ransom in place of many. I came to give my life as a ransom in place of many. 
this is either the highest form of megalomania or it is in fact Jesus, the Son of God, subjecting himself to the cruelty of that cross. Just thinking about that cross, I often sit up there in the balcony and look at the beautiful, well-made, softly lit cross at the back of our church. And I think about all of those millions of crosses around the world that are above or in or on round churches or <coughs> in cemeteries or even in jewellery shops. A little story really happened in Watford. I won't advertise the big jewellery shop, they don't deserve it, but this father and daughter, teenage daughter, was stood by the plate glass window and it was, the father was heard to say, well, Sally, you have really studied and worked so hard over these last four years and now you've graduated with honours in your exams. You can choose anything up to a hundred pounds from the window here as a present in a, a reward for all the hard work you've done. And Sally looked in the window and she said, Dad, I would like that little thin gold chain with the little cross hanging on it, the one that's got the little man hanging on the front. Can I have that one? Sh certainly. And so they transferred, the, the, did the, did the uh, transaction. And then she said to her dad, Dad, who is that little man on the cross? Who is that little man on the cross? And as we look at our cross, I think it would do us well, beautiful and well made as it is, and very fitting for this place. Never let us lose the fact, the thought that all of these crosses point to just one cross. And it wasn't a smooth, comfortable cross. It was a roughly hewn, two splintery pieces of wood that were fastened together and Jesus had dragged that for miles and then uh, got out onto the hill where it was finally put on the ground and Jesus was thrown roughly down on it and the soldiers held him down, I imagine, one soldier holding each wrist and another soldier with a hammer and huge nail as he lifted that hammer, positioned the nail and with one huge whack sent that spike through the hands of Jesus. And then on the other side, and more soldiers on his feet, holding him down to that rough, splintery, rough-hewn cross, the old rugged cross. And Jesus was pinned there. But that wasn't the end of it. They lifted up the cross and then, without care or caution, took joy in dropping it into the hole with a thump and then wedging it upright. What pain that must have been. And the girl asks her father, Dad, who is that little man on the cross? We are living in a world where there is a great need to tell our children, to tell our neighbours and to tell our friends about Jesus. It wasn't a very pleasant experience at all. It has been somewhat sanitised as we talk about, yes, Jesus died on the cross. But the reality of it is quite horrendous. So, Lee Strobel moved on to various other chapters, and this is the book that um, I recommend that if you can possibly find the time to buy it and read it, or even online to read it, it is a gripping read of a journey that took nearly two years for this agnostic uh, lawyer who was trying to prove to his wife how foolish she was to have confidence in the Bible and Jesus. But at the end of those two years, he had himself been touched by all the evidence. And today, he is a committed, a fervent, passionate Christian, passionate about what he has discovered. And he's left behind that old life of backstabbing, and rough living 
and he is an ambassador for Christ. And what's more, I would like you, if you get the chance, no, you must do it. You must look up, Google Lee Strobel. Google it this afternoon, not in class, thank you. <laughs> and read about one of his testimonies because it is absolutely a wonderful story. He went on and looked at the psychological profect, um, profile because that's what they do in criminal courts. But he discovered that um, Jesus was completely normal, rational, sensitive, selfless, humble and simple. In fact, he was just a perfect individual. He never demonstrated inappropriate emotions or behaviour. He cried at the death of Lazarus. This was a normal thing to do. He was hungry and tired at times. He was sensitive to the needs of others, was in contact with reality. He was not paranoid, but calmly submitted to prophetic timetable. He had amazing insights into human nature, especially as he dealt with Peter and the disciples. He was socially well adjusted, dressed normally, fitted in with others. He was compassion, compassionate, but not immobilized by any situation. He was calm. He met individuals exactly where they were and as they were needed, especially in the case of Zacchaeus. He was direct about his identity, but he was not boastful. He referred to John the Baptist to his miracles to prove his design, uh, his messiahship. And his miracles were permanent and major. They were healings with long life, uh, uh, goodness and benefit healings of blindness, lameness, hemorrhaging, and even death. That is quite a testimony. And today they still use personal profiling to look at people in court to see whether they fit the charges of the criminal charges that have been brought against them or whether it is just improbable. So, Jesus Perhaps he was a hypnotist. That was another chapter that he in investigated. But when he looked at it, you had the improbability, the extreme unlikeliness that Jesus would have been hypnotizing all of these people who came to the tomb willingly. Saul, who was a, a kicking against being a follower of Jesus, and all of those who were in the Roman guards, they would not have been subjects for, hypno for hypnotic trance. It was just um, analysed and totally ruled out. The miraculous healings were profound and they were numerous and they were lasting. <coughs> his resurrection, though, was the profound vindication of his identity. But he also forgave sins, as in John 8, 11, he said to the woman, at this time, those who heard had begun to go away one at a time. This is when the woman is being accused and all those who were gathering around Jesus writes in the sand. And in the end he said, um, Gee, he, woman, where are they that accuse thee? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn thee, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Then Lee Strobel moves on to chapter 11. Now, you don't have to read chapter 11 if you have bad blood pressure. I couldn't believe it. Now, my bad blood pressure is not that bad, but when I read through it, by the end of that chapter, my blood pressure was up here. It was the, the graphic story of what they did to Jesus. Now, if you look in Psalm 22, verses 18 to... 14 to 18 particularly, um, in Psalm 22, we have the most remarkable prophecy. Because at least a thousand years before Jesus was crucified, these lines were penned. In verse 14 it said, I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned to wax, uh, it has melted within me, my mouth is dried up like potsherd. My tongue st sticks to the roof of my mouth. You lay me in the dust of the earth. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. That is probably one of the most direct 
um, descriptions of what happened to be sure that all of this in Psalm 22 is talking about the crucifixion. And they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garments. All those prophecies over a thousand years before. Now, if I can be a little Irish for a moment, I, I would like to say that this particular uh, uh, prophecy is what you call not just exceptional, that Jesus was going to die, but it's exceptionally exceptional. It's remarkably remarkable because when the prophecy was written, it's a thousand years before the punishment technique that the Romans used of crucifixion was even invented. Do you get it? Crucifixion wasn't even thought of or practiced or invented. And yet, it is laid out in Psalm 22. I say that's remarkably remarkable. Now, let's look for a moment at another aspect that Lee thoroughly examined. Now, he had lots of friends and he traveled all over different points in the United States to find expert witnesses. And he found some top mathematicians. And they looked at the probability of these pro uh, prophecies being fulfilled. And so they sat down with the mathematicians and they translated the, and they, they have skillful ways of doing this, they translated the script into mathematical expressions which could then be um, tested. And so with just testing eight, just eight of the 48 prophecies about the crucifixion of Christ, pointing forward to that crucifixion, the probability of this being, of Jesus Christ being fake, fake was the same probability as trying to find one fake 20 pence coin amongst a lot of 20 pence coins sufficient that would cover all of the British Isles from north to south, from east to west, to a depth of two metres. Can you imagine all that money? All that money out there, there's no room to walk. The whole of the British Isles is covered with this 20 pence stack, side by side, two metres high. Somewhere up maybe Lincoln or John Groats or Cornwall, there's one. One in several billions that these prophecies could be false. It's overwhelming just that those eight prophecies had to be um, genuine. But the fact is, remember I said that was only eight. The probability that all 48, all 48 prophecies about the coming Christ <coughs> would be like finding one grain of sand which you put under the microscope and it says fake. One grain of sand from anywhere, perhaps on the beaches, the seasides, the deserts, somewhere in Africa or in Chile, somewhere, there's this grain of sand, one in a trillion to the 13th power. The mathematicians, with no prompting or bias, they simply translated the probability of 48... <coughs> excuse me. Not to confuse my water with the WD-40. It's very good, but not for drinking. The probability that 48 of these prophecies could have happened by chance is one in a trillion to the 13th power. Now, we can't even imagine what a trillion is. But if you multiply, multiply a trillion by a trillion by a trillion by itself 13 times, you have an enormous number. So... In other words, the ma mathematicians in Lee's book, they concluded that it was just beyond question the probability that Jesus could have been a fake. He could not have arranged his own death. He could not have arranged his place of birth. Your birth certificate, you know, you, you can't do much about it, can you? You're registered where you're born, whether you like it or not. And Jesus was going to be born in Bethlehem, and he was born in Bethlehem. His legs remained unbroken on the cross, 
And do you know why? Because as he hung on the cross there, it wasn't the loss of blood that killed Jesus. It was asphyxiation. Because any person hanging bodily on the cross after a certain period of time, <coughs> the only way that they're able to breathe is to contract the chest. <sighs> and uh, this went on hour after hour. And it was helpful that your legs could push you up to help you breathe. Now, when the soldiers came around to check Jesus and the other two on either side of him, you know the story, don't you? They took their, um, the, the two robbers, <coughs> they, the Roman soldiers looked at them and they could see they were still going, <sighs> there was still life in them. So they took their heavy swords smashed them across their shins and broke their legs so that there was no more. They just, and very soon died. But they looked at Jesus, and what did they say? This one's gone. No need to smash his legs. What an incredible coincidence, isn't it? Just remarkably remarkable. Did you know that they tried to suggest that maybe something that was in the vinegar, uh, in the, in the, in the uh, wad that they put on the end of a stick, which was actually a sour... They thought, that maybe, was it possibly an anaesthetic that put him to sleep for three days so he could wake up again? And that was completely ruled out under a Roman crucifixion. You don't get away with tricks like that. But crucifixion, the word, comes as you know, you've got crucify, crucifixion, uh, crusades, uh, excruciating even. These words are all derived from the Latin root crux, crucis, the cross. Crux, crucis, the cross. Excruciating, ex means out of, crux, it means that it, this was pain that was related to or described by the experience of crucifixion on the cross. So when the doctor says to you, I've been in hospital, and they say, describe your pain for us on the scale of one to ten. And you think, mm, maybe three today. <gasps> oh, it's terrible today, it's nine, it's ten, it's excruciating, it's ten. Do you know, excruciating is not ten. Excruciating is about twenty. Way above anything that we can know. That word excruciating, we shouldn't use it too loosely because really, in truth, it's what Jesus experienced beyond imagination. And the other thing in the Psalms where it mentions that my bones were out of joint, hanging on the cross there like that with your body, in a weakened condition, the shoulder joints soon dislocate. And so that is absolutely remarkable. Then at the end of the book, Lee thought, you know, I seem to have, um, I seem to have um, shot myself in the foot here. This evidence is incredible. I didn't know this about Jesus. Leslie has done these studies with her friend. Do you know what? It looks like she's got something. It, I, I would never have believed it. But I've got one last chance. <coughs> I know an, a legal chappy by the name of Lionel Lucku. In fact, he was Sir Lionel Lucku, L-U-C-K-H-O-O. And he was nicknamed Mr. Loophole because of the 274 cases of um, murder that had been brought to him to analyse to try to get the person off. Lionel Mr. Loophole had found a flaw in the argument for every one of those 274 cases. He found a, a flaw in the argument. And so uh, Lee Strobel thought, this is my last chance. See what Loophole can do for me. And Mr. Loophole analysed all of Lee Strobel's 13 different um, systems of research and he came back with this statement. I can say unequivocally that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus Christ 
is so overwhelming that it compels acceptance by proof that leaves absolutely no room for doubt. Well, loophole had failed to find a loophole. Let's change tack for a moment. That's all right. It's keen to get working, you see. It wants to get started. I think I'll put it this way. Is, put your hand up, please, and tell me if you've got any of this in your household. Yeah, Peter has. Anybody else has got this at home? Hands up everywhere. All right, hands to. Uh, let, let's try it the other way. Who hasn't got some of this in your household? Ah, oh, one, two, three. Right, we've got news for you. Oh, good man, thank you. It's called WD-40. And um, some years back, the aerospace in industry was having difficulty with condensation within some of the uh, systems. And so two industrial chemists were assigned the task. They said, right, for the foreseeable future, we want you to find us a product, find us a solution to this problem of getting rid of dis and displacing water on the delicate instruments within our spaceships and our aeroplanes and equipment. And so after only 40 experiments, considering that Thomas Edison took 3,000 experiments to devise the first successful light bulb, but only after 40 experiments with fish oils and various other chemicals, they came up with something that they thought, this is really good, it's doing the job. It displaces water. And uh, they uh, came back to their bosses and said, yes, we've got it. Sorry about the tickly throat. WD-40. If you haven't got some at home, I recommend you get it. But I ask you, have you ever heard it advertised? Have you ever seen billboards for it? Have you heard, um, on, even on the advertising on, in the media? You know, WD-40 doesn't need to be advertised. It doesn't need big bucks campaigns and expensive programs to get it out there into all the households. It's probably one of the most ubiquitous products on the earth, not only in this country, but all around the world. And yet it isn't advertised. What can we take from this? You know, the days were that we had the likes of Billy Graham and Jim Cherry and various other great luminaries who did a wonderful job in meeting in big tents, big halls, big theatres, places where they could draw the crowds and talk about Jesus and persuade and baptise many. But in the Western world today, these old techniques don't seem to be effective. We have too much competition in various ways. And then I thought about this WD-40. It does what it says in the tin. And when people use it, they recommend it with intelligent passion. A couple of weeks ago, our son moved into a new house and uh, everybody was there busily doing stuff, painting and so on, and Jean and I thought, ah, that old patio set. Um, I read that it can revive oxidised plastic furniture, especially garden furniture that stands out over winter. So I said, come on, Jean, let's try this. I had the rag and... She, no, I had the spray. I had the easy bit, and she had the rag... And uh, we, one chair at a time, six chairs and a patio table, in no time at all, we had sprayed it over, given it a wipe. Wow, it just came from yuck to new. And when Troy and the others came out and said, where did you find this new patio set? It was totally transformed. And if you know something is good, yes, I want you to get excited about WD-40 today. I want you to do your homework and go on to the site and look at some of the 2,000 plus uses that come along with WD-40, apart from its central displacement of water. 
Lots of other things that'll help you to keep squirrels. It'll remove stickers from glass. Yeah, we did some of that. You know, you take a sticker off the glass and you've got that glue, it's so hard to ship. To stop squirrels getting up the pole to steal from the bird table. To, to get, if you have a boat, it'll take barnacles off the bottom of your boat. It'll restore faded plastic furniture. It'll remove bug splats and so forth. Bird line from your car and your chrome. And I've tried it and it's great. How much more, how many trillion times more meaningful is it that we speak personally at every opportunity to recommend Jesus Christ and the message of this Bible? It does what it says on the tin and a lot more. It saves to the kingdom and then... The promises of Jesus that have not yet been fulfilled are just a few. There are thousands that we can look back on and have the intelligent evidence. We have abundant, overwhelming, intelligent evidence that we can really get excited about. And while we may not be going for the big bucks campaigns now, I think that we still have the opportunity that the Christians of the early church had how did they reach their neighbours and their, their fellow travellers, their fellow pilgrims? By word of mouth, at every opportunity, they spoke with conviction. They said, just like WD-40, it does what it says in the tin. So does Jesus. It brings a load more benefits when you accept Christ. So does our Jesus. And I will be the first to confess that there have been many opportunities when I could have spoken more powerfully, more meaningfully to support the Jesus who died for us. But I stand here to declare today that from this day on, I want to be more intelligently passionate in talking about Jesus. I wonder, would you think about that? Consider standing to your feet to say, yes, I too recognise that I haven't really always grabbed those opportunities to do the WD-40 syndrome and say, I've tried Jesus, he works for me.